You're beaming. When did you first meet Jack Benny? Well, actually, when Bing Crosby's first wife died. Dixie. Dixie. Uh, I was on the Bob Crosby Club 15, oh, the last of the big well. days of radio. And uh, it happened so very quickly that Dixie died that Bob had to go and join the family. Right. And uh, Jack Benny was right next door. So he was brought in at the last minute and played all the skits with me. And I was so thrilled. I was so choked up. I couldn't stand it. So I met Jack Benny really on the spur of the moment on the air, more or less on the air. And then uh, a year later, we, uh, the Bob Crosby show, as Bob used to say, Campbell Soups can everything. They finally canned us. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so uh, we went to uh, the Sahara in Las Vegas, yeah. and Jack Benny came to see Bob, who was on his radio show. Right, Irving? That's right. And uh, he saw me on the show and said, I want her for my tour with Sammy Davis, who was then right. not quite as well known as he is today. Right. So we went uh, on a tour. Long tour. Long tour, four months. Right. And I learned everything in timing that I could possibly learn from this wonderful man. I saw you together, oh. and you were absolutely... When you used to do the violin duets, <laughs> because Giselle plays very fine violin. Well, I used to. I don't anymore. I put it away with Mr. Benny. You know. It was... Those were great moments. And they did a classic routine together that became very famous in showbiz. You did uh, Getting to Know Me. It was locked up at UCLA for 100 years. Isn't that right? Oh, did they do that with that? Oh, yes. The film? That's one of them. But I must tell you one little thing about that. Right. And I don't even think that... Irving remembers this. Uh, right after the hit parade came off the air, I had my own show, right. which is on McKenzie Show, which is a good name for a show, which yeah, is your yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. name. <laughs> and uh, one night, Jack was my guest star, and we started to play together one of our duets. And it wasn't getting to know, it was something else. And all of a sudden, I was wearing a strapless. See, last time I was on your show, something happened to me. I, I better know. not. My zipper broke last time I was on Merv's show. That's right. But... Anyway, this night, I had this strapless gown, and we're playing the violin. Now, there's one thing that's impossible to do, and that is to keep a strapless dress on and play the violin at the same time. <laughs> and my zipper broke, you know, like that. And I started to back against the set to keep my dress on and keep playing, you see. And Jack is going, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, that kind of thing. Well, all of a sudden, I thought, well, what else can I do? And I was playing this mad duet. We played Charvis or something, some mad number. But, you know, and I was still trying to back up against the set to keep my dress up. When Jack said, what in the world are you doing? I turned around and showed him my zipper, which was like falling on the floor. And there was nothing between me except a pair of panties and a few other little things like that. So he died. He just stopped the whole thing, fell on the floor. <laughs> I know. Just hit the floor, you know, I that know. kind of thing. Did he ever give you any theatrical advice that you remember? Oh, yes, the greatest. He told me, and you know, when you travel with a, a, a man like Jack, uh, when you travel with him for four months, I swear this man had a, he had a radar in his nose where his audience was concerned. He used to be like a, like a bunny rabbit smelling lettuce, you know. He just smelled his audience. He knew exactly what timing to use with his nose. And a few times when we played from city to city, he would say to everyone, including Sammy Davis and me, and he told the entire cast, he said, no last night jokes. He said, the audience deserves the same beautiful show that the first night deserves, the first night ah, audience. Good. He said, if I ever catch any of you playing these ridiculous inside jokes that actors like to play on each other, he said, I'll never, never work with you again. And he meant it for everyone. He had a great respect for his audience. Oh, yes. He, he thought that the audience was it. And he said, another thing, never talk down to your audience. Right. Talk up because they're smarter than you think. That's right. You know? That was Jack Benny. Huh? And we'll be back after this message. He began working for Jack Benny in 1939, did a complete range of voices, sound effects, characters on both the Benny radio and television shows. He's the creator of the most popular voices in show business, including Bugs Bunny. He's the voice of Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Porky Pig, and countless others. Would you welcome Mel Blanc? How did you first come to work for Jack Benny? Well, Jack had seen me in the cartoons, or heard me, 
And he had a bear in his basement called Carmichael. Right. And uh, was guarding his vault. Oh, I remember. <laughs> so uh, he called me in one day and he said, can you do the growl of Carmichael? I said, I think I can. He said, how would it sound? I said, well, it'd sound a little like this. <laughs> he says, great, great, you're on next week. <laughs> So for six months, all I did was a growl of a bear. <laughs> Finally, I said to him, you know, Mr. Benny, I can also talk. <laughs> How about that? Put him on the he, floor. Was, he was pounding the floor. Yeah, yeah. So he said, I'll have the writers write something in for you. You also, as I recall, Mel, were the sound of his famous Maxwell. Yeah, that's right. That was a funny But by, that was a, by accident, wasn't it? Yeah, I, uh, at the rehearsal, you know, Jack liked to have the rehearsal just like the show was going to be. So he'd know what to cut, what not to cut. Yeah. And uh, it came to the spot where the Maxwell was supposed to stop and die out. And I saw that the sound effects man didn't have that electric plug in because it was played on a turntable. So before that, I had a chance to tell them it came to the queue, and I did it verbally, or audio, like this. also have here, I, we have an audio disc of you, Mel, you played, uh, you played his violin teacher, the French, uh, Leblanc, Leblanc, oui. Leblanc. Oui. Oui. Do, we, oui. do we have that tape? Play it, this is an audio tape, listen, this is a scene with Jack Benny and Mel Blanc. Watch. <laughs> That's enough, Mr. Benny. No, try you for Metro again. Yes, sir. No, 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 Mr. Benny. What? Please, a violin is a delicate instrument. It has a heart. It has a soul. You have already broken its heart. Have pity on its soul. <laughs> I see. You see, you see, you see. Please, Professor, control yourself. Would you like a glass of water? Yes. Put a little cyanide in it. <laughs> Not till we finish the lesson. All right, all right. Take the exercises once more. Yes. Play it softly, play it tender. Where can I go to surrender? <laughs> make the notes a smoother mixture. This is worse than your last picture. <laughs> Oh, yeah. He also did Anaheim, Azusa, and Coop. Oh, the railroad yeah, station. The, 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 the car, yeah. Train leaving on track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and Coop. Come on, girl. <laughs> <laughs> and see inside? See, the, yeah, that's this one. Yeah. Let's see how good he is. This is one of the great routines you did with Jack Benny. He always brought uh, Jack up. Why don't you, why you play Jack? All right, I'll be Jack. Um, does this train go to Chicago? She. <laughs> Is it on time? She. What's your name? Sai. 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 She. Are you married? She. What's your wife's name? Su. Su. She. Does your wife work? She. What does she do? So. So? See? See? <laughs> 